Well, hello everyone. You're listening to Sync Talk on the line. I'm lucky enough to have a few guests joining me today all the way across the water in Leeds. They are part of the team at WMP, which comprises a very talented team of composers and sound designers who work with music supervisors, production companies, and the moving image industry. Some of the substantial brands they have worked with include Airbnb, Helly Hansen, and Tanqueray Gin. So let's introduce our guests now we have with us Ben McAvoy, WMP's director, and creatives Kamal Kamrudin, William Featherby, and Peter Ellen Brown. Hello, welcome everyone. Hey, hey. thanks for having us, Victoria. Thanks for having us. Oh, yeah, you're very welcome. So, I really would like to know about how WMP started and uh, does WMP actually stand for something? <laughs> oh, no. Um, <laughs> WMP started in um, goodness in 2007. Um, it was a company that was set up straight out of uh, me studying at Leeds College of Music um, and graduating from from a course um, here in Leeds. And really, with the design of kind of trying to do things a little bit differently in the industry by by way of sort of actually running a, a sort of composition agency where we employ composers and where we where we have a team of people that we're working with. Although for the first sort of two or three years, really didn't know what on earth I was doing um, in that kind of realm, really. Um, and um, yeah, the rest is history, really, as they say. We've kind of grown from there. The team's grown, the studios have grown, our client base has grown, and, and so is our portfolio, really. So it's been, um, goodness, that was probably 13 years ago um, that we set up. So uh, it's been a while. It's been a, been a hot second, as the kids are saying. <laughs> oh, no. Are we really that much older? <laughs> I don't know. It, like, we, we have this, oh, don't start on ages, because there's jokes that go around the team. I think Pete was born in 1997. <laughs> 94, 94, guys. So speaking of your portfolio, yeah. so I was stalking your Instagram a little bit. Um, you guys are very talented, some incredible music coming out of your studio and your brains, and it looks like that you play every conceivable instrument under the sun. And I want to know, how is this actually possible, and do you actually bring new team members in according to the instruments that they play or don't play? Who's going to take that? <laughs> I think we, so between us, I think if you count ukulele as its own instrument, we, we play about seven, probably seven or eight instruments across the team. But, um, we, you know, we use a lot of freelancers. So that probably gives the, gives the impression that we play absolutely everything, but we've got, um, some really close collaborators that we get in regularly. So just trusted session musicians who, um, mostly leads based, actually, there's just such a good pool of talent up here in the north um and so we get a lot of um especially string players like che- we have a cellist called rose that we use a lot um and we have um various other instrumentalists that we get into play um I'm, I'm one of the guys who is i think in one of the sort of instagram piece of footage is pete who was playing on our hammond organ and he's a fantastic musician as well covering a lot a lot of instruments just by himself Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, here I was thinking you play everything. So now I'm very disappointed. (laughs) This one's to Ben. um, And you and I had an initial call to set this up. And you mentioned wanting to talk about some of the challenges of, well, shall we call it survival, really, um, in this industry. And um, I guess we wouldn't be addressing the elephant in the room if we didn't talk about the current COVID-19 situation. Mm -hmm. It's so present for us. So um, look, how is it affecting the way you guys work and create it's a really good question for us it's kind of been um a challenge that we definitely didn't predict um and it's a challenge that i think we've all adapted to but i mean i couldn't be prouder of the team here like than i am today like it's it, the last four weeks have just been an incredible test for us weirdly I, I guess you could kind of summarize it in the sense that it sort of feels a little bit like we've lost some of our some of our kind of USP, some of what makes us unique, because, you know, we, we, we sort of leveled the playing field. You know, most most composers in, in our industry or most teams of composers are working in small studios or even from home. Um, and we aren't. We're working from a kind of big complex of studios that we rent that's kind of all connected. And we have 
um, you know, sort of individual spaces that we can work in and we can record a lot of instruments live and we can do, you know, we've got pianos and we've got, you know, we can do drums and we can do vocals and we can do lots of different things kind of in a live setting that we now can't do so easily. So we've had to just really adapt and kind of find new ways of doing things. And we've got pitches on currently that are kind of using those new ways of doing things. And um, it's, it, you know, from a creative point of view, I, I think it's just new for us. It's just a bit different. And it's been a bit of a kind of a bit of a, um, yeah, it's just taken some time to get used to. Um, in terms of work level and in terms of kind of the industry as a whole, um, there are two sides to this for me. First of all, um, you know, we have an attitude of being relentlessly positive within our team. Um, you know, we have to be in terms of pitching for work generally anyway. So we're kind of trying to plan for every scenario, but not kind of live in worst case scenario, if that makes sense. I know that sounds a bit cliche, but we don't know what's going to be happening next week or the week after. We've kind of just got to go with what we've got now and what's going on now. Um, and and so far, you know, we've found opportunities and we've won pitches and we've been working quite closely with the clients that we work with anyway. Um, and, and, and things seem to be kind of going OK. Um, I, I think that more generally in terms of the industry, there's definitely a, a, a slowdown just because particularly in, in terms of new stuff, because things aren't being shot because you can't shoot. You can't shoot in the same way that you would do normally. Mm. Um, and, and that's been challenging, I think, for the industry as a whole. The flip side of that, though, is just how incredibly innovative the creative communities become, um, you know, in a really short period of time. It's, it's, it's incredible to see some of the stories coming out of just new relationships being forged. People that normally, would, I guess, would be competing against each other now working together in much more of a kind of collaborative way. Um, you know, and there's been stories all over the place, all over Twitter and all over Instagram and, and, and lots of, you know, lots of people from various different levels of, of, of work um, really coming together to kind of forge a new a new creative community. And I feel like I kind of want that to stay, like when all of this is blown over, I don't really want that to disappear. So, yeah, there's definitely two sides to it. You know, there's the worry and the concern for the work, but there's also the kind of incredible brilliance and, and just creative ingeniousness that has come out of it as well. Wow, that's fantastic, Ben. I completely agree with you. I think we're all going to be resetting right now and how we uh, face these challenges and come through to the other side really is how I think we're going to make our mark in a new world because it will have changed irreversibly. Um, and I think that as creatives, we really are often the ones who lead the way. Um, but, you know, I was thinking too about your statement about trying to actually plan for everything. It's kind of hard to plan for a pandemic. And, you know, pandemics really do bring out cliches. Like you say, you can't really predict the future. I mean, as we're speaking, there's just I've just had a news alert that the lockdown here in the UK will continue for uh, another three weeks. So I guess like a lot of it is planning um, as soon as you find out the information and make like we... <sighs> One of the biggest challenges for us has been, um, although we are um, working in separate rooms in our studio block, we do see each other in person quite a lot during the day, uh, even just to listen to ideas or um, collaborate, just plug in, you know, a guitar into a, um, a computer and, and record a part for someone. Um, something like that you really take for granted once you're working from home. Also, like a kind of a challenge that we've had is that because we're based in the same uh, building, we have like a centralized um, place where all our projects are kept so we can refer back to them and we can um, work like work on the same project at the same time. Uh, so Kamal actually has been a big part in, in transitioning us to um, working remotely through like a f shared file system so that we're able to still maintain some semblance of that uh, kind of quick collaborative nature uh, but it's definitely been something to get used to that's awesome thanks will so kamal how are you keeping everyone organized um well i think it's it's been a, a continuation of what we've tried to do in the studio in some ways because as ben said our usp is is being collaborative and working as a team and um, as will touched on as well 
it, although we work in separate studio rooms, so we can be working on multiple different projects at once, we're also able to be collaborating on the same track, different parts of the same track in different rooms at the same time. And um, if we were to, to lose that working in this new situation, it would not just um, be something that well, our clients would lose out on, but I think because we we are so used to working in that way, it would feel just like a completely different world. And obviously, to a certain extent, it feels like a different world anyway. But um, it was being important to try and to replicate as much of that as possible remotely, um, and transitioning to to some kind of similar system, but that obviously has a bit more of a time delay because it's all uploading over over the internet rather than being on a local network where where it's all instantaneous um but it's but it's definitely been a a a good challenge for us and I think we've we've done a good job of overcoming it and and actually one of the things that that we we found from working as a team anyway is that um working as a freelance composer can be quite isolating anyway and we all appreciate working as part of a team in a studio together so to try and keep that going in a time where we're forced into some kind of isolation anyway um, has actually been really helpful for our our state of well-being as well I think. Oh for sure and so what would you say is your superstar uh, software or collaboration tool which has risen to the top and saved all of you? That's a good question. Um, I think the thing that we don't normally use that we're using now is Dropbox, um, which which obviously some people rely on day to day anyway. But because we work from a centralized server in the studio, we don't ever really need to kind of um, work live off Dropbox. It, it just works as a kind of offsite backup for us. But um, but that's been a a real real shift for us. We already use things like Slack. Um, to stay in touch with each other between rooms anyway. So that hasn't changed. Slack is just insane right now because we use it with our team and I've been playing around with the sounds for the notifications. Have you guys done that? <laughs> I think <laughs> a little has, bit. Yeah. <laughs> so the, just um, going back to the challenges, can we actually talk a little bit about some of the more general challenges that a team like you would face in a, in a normal environment? I think that we've been doing this for long enough now, or at least we've been pitching. We've been pitching for advertising, like with sync supervisors, and we've been building relationships with some of the people that we work with now for ten years or so. Um, so we've kind of been doing it for long enough to notice changes in the industry and changes in terms of the way that things are done. And I think, and again, this sounds cliche, but just in terms of uh, probably our biggest challenge is just the level of competition that there is now in terms of um, it, what used to be quite a niche bespoke music scene. Um, you know, it, it's difficult to sort of talk about this without sounding bitter and twisted. We aren't at all. Again, we adapt and we change and we evolve and we move forward with with whatever kind of challenges we, we face. But I think that um, m- music is our competition, whereas it wasn't before. Um, and, and uh, you know, any kind of music, whether it be library, whether it be kind of pre-existing or commercial or bespoke, um, is kind of all viewed in the same sort of realm now. It's definitely an exploration of, uh, you know, as to what might work with a brand. Um, and so projects have generally got harder to win, I think. And, and you know, in fact, actually, we have a kind of, you know, a, a step back from that where we're actually kind of immensely proud to get through to the final round of most projects. Um, that we work on and and our perspective sort of shifted over the last three or four years in terms of that um, so yeah I think it's um the, the, it's a very competitive flooded market at the moment really it's getting harder to win work um, that's me mm, thank you Ben so you wanted to throw over to Pete yeah yeah or, or Will or anybody I think I think Will you had a um not to throw you in it but you had a good story just about um sort of client interpretations and 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 that kind of thing. Yeah, not to throw you in it, but I'm throwing you in it. Yeah, he basically <laughs> just did the thing. Yeah. Um I mean I I wouldn't say it's a horror story. It's definitely um one of the stories where we reflect back on our kind of role because a lot of a lot of us see ourselves as composers, sound designers, um and 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 the stuff surrounding the music side, but also a big part of what we do is interpreting 
a brief that is given to us, uh, however long or short the brief is, and then also um, going into more detail with that, um, like either on a phone call, a Skype, or some kind of way of kind of asking some questions to add more depth to the brief. Um, and I know that one, I think the thing Pete is referring to is that uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, uh, we were working on a project, a charity project, actually, that um, it fe- like I play trombone personally, and it featured a trombone line that, well, the, the brief said that they wanted a trombone line. And um, usually that's a, enough information. If they say like, oh, we want it to sound like this example, or um, this is the kind of thing we're thinking of. But um, I remember that I was on this phone call and I was recording it at the time so that I could refer back to it. Um, and the uh, this person that worked at the agency started singing the trombone line to me. <laughs> um, so it wasn't like it wasn't incredibly melodic either. It was like a kind of um, like an umpa sort of trombone sound. Um so I, I guess like the lesson from that is that we do actually have to do a fair amount of interpretation and also just <laughs> expect expect people to get quite involved in detail I think that through all the years that I've worked with creatives and musicians in particular we are a kind of a, a special breed I think mm. we have our own ways of communicating and we laugh at things that yeah. other people don't get and we're a bit irreverent <laughs> yeah and just on the subject of laughing at mm. things, I think we get quite a unique view sometimes. At, um, if we're working on a um, like a television advert or something, uh, we usually see it in the early stages uh, of like pre-production or pre-visual effects. So there's there's sometimes things that you know you, you would see on your TV, like you'd see an animated character on screen um, in the final advert, but at the stages where we're writing music to it we might get a film that basically just has a like a pencil drawing of that character and like some uh some guy in a, a morph suit like a black morph suit would be like walking around the scene like carrying it around um so you definitely get like a unique view into how things are made yeah for sure and you know we could probably you know not really give it the value or you know laugh at ourselves however i think that's what really sets us apart is that creativity and that different way of looking at things and then I guess that's what um, actually brings in the clients isn't it is the way that you interpret in a way that actually fulfills the brief and has a commercial value to it yeah 100 percent. yeah um when you're fulfilling a brief and you know I'm taking this from your website how do you continue to weave in and out of the narrative with curiosity I think, um, do you know what? It's actually having a really clear brief is helpful in that sense. It seems like, uh, you know, people can often ask us, oh, do you find it really restrictive when like they're telling you like, oh, we want it to sound exactly like this or that. But I think, to be honest, I think we more worry if we receive a brief that is super open because as soon as we get a brief that's like hardly anything or, oh, we were thinking this or that or this and that, I think we can, often it's that worry that actually these, you know, the, the client doesn't actually know at all what they want. And then, you know, you th- you're thinking to yourself, you know, do we do we really have a chance with this? Whereas when you've got a brief that's quite clear, you can start to think, okay, how can we actually creatively move within this thing? So when they say this emotion, like what could we do to really draw it out? Like what what's going to work really well with this film? So it's kind of starting from that place and knowing what are your, what are the boundaries you're working within? Um, and then going from there, I think one thing that we we try to do a lot and you know I think Tancro was an example of that in terms of the track that was that ended up on the ad is that we we always try to think of a wild card so we'll you know we'll submit often a few different demos for a project um but we'll also try and think you know what what is something that is actually outside of the scope of the brief maybe something that the client hasn't thought of something that the music supervisor hasn't mentioned yet but we think could work really well to picture obviously it's always got a it's always got a work to picture um um but yeah so we we try and um, often submit something or write something that's just a little bit different it's a bit of a yeah a wild card option so what level of success do you have with these wild cards oh that's a good question ben oh. 
it varies quite considerably, really. Um, generally speaking, they're fairly successful when because we, you know, we're not talking about submitting wildcards for every single job. That's not really our strategy. It's, it's kind of identifying when they might be appropriate and, and what might be appropriate for that pitch. You know, it, effectively, the briefing process is trying to, you know, we're talking to a sync supervisor who's absorbing a brief and then and then and then telling us what the agency thinks the brand might need but we're never actually talking to the brand so effectively we're always trying to think about what the brand what the brand might want to hear or what options they might want to hear as well as even the brief that we've been told to kind of write so um so you know i would say that you know our general success rate in terms of winning pitches is sort of um you know i think we win sort of 30% 30% of the pitches that we that we pitch for um and 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 wild cards generally are are part of winning um winning most of those these days they're not always the thing that's chosen but they're always they're always submitted and i i think we feel quite lucky that we've got a really great relationship with most of the supervisors that we work with now we've been working with most of them for a while um, and they trust us so when we send something that we say is a wild card if we feel like it's working generally speaking it will be submitted alongside ours and so sometimes what happens is even subconsciously it has an effect on on, on our demo or one of our demos being the one that's chosen even if it isn't the one that's actually ending up winning the pitch um, if that makes any sense at all victoria i don't know it makes total sense. And, yeah. you know, um, receiving um, pictures from a brief, I always appreciate something that really fits the brief and you understand it and then actually something else because it, even if you don't use it, it really shows that the person or, or the team is really thinking outside of the box. They're really testing the boundaries. They're, they're trying out new things. And that's the key, I think, to moving the world of creativity forward is we have to continually push those creative boundaries and we're the ones to do it Mm. yeah absolutely and I think I I think a lot of the time I think someone alluded to earlier the the briefs and the creative process they move at quite a breakneck speed um and they evolve and they it's a, a big part of what we do is trying to predict what that next step is in the brief because although you know, it, it's, it's not always the case that it completely changes from the original brief, but there, there usually is something that um, it, it's kind of our uh, our role as creatives is to um, be creative and, and add that little thing that kind of moves the process forward and gets someone excited. Um, because I know that a lot of the time the brief is what people would want to hear, but then you need to kind of add something that hooks them in and and gets them engaged with your with your demo uh, for the next stage. Mm. Oh, for sure. And I think you guys should probably put translator on your CVs as well. <laughs> yeah, I was um, just going to say that part of our origin story really has been working on um, commission bespoke briefs um, before we uh, got into pitching for ads. And when you have a, a trust in the process from the client where they know that you're committed to the to the process and that you will do everything you can to meet their brief regardless of the journey that you go on to get there i think when when we come to pitching for ads we're trying to get into that position where um, we can demonstrate that we are committed to the process that we're thinking about what we're doing we're we're not just doing exactly what we're told but we're also we, we are doing that but we're also bringing um, something different, something um, perhaps that hasn't been thought of yet, or we're looking at it from a different angle. And then you can really build that collaborative process with um, whoever's producing the ad. Well, you've probably got kitchen sinks around you a lot right now. So that's that's pretty easy. Good one. Um, so we have a very big community of composers and songwriters and um, musicians and is there a little gem of wisdom that you could impart to them? Yeah, I'll go first. I think we've probably each got one. Mine is just um, be patient. I think uh, be patient. You know, th- this 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 industry, particularly on the commercial side, as we've already touched on, is incredibly competitive. Um, you know, uh, building relationships takes time. Winning work takes time. Um, you know, 
uh, be patient with everything everything you know it's, it's 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 an incredibly it's like the opposite of the composition process for advertising it's you know we get two days to do a demo um you know you're talking about the the absolute opposite in terms of uh, how patient you need to be in order to kind of start making uh, moves in this industry so yeah be patient i've said it loads <laughs> i'll say it again <laughs> that's perfect does someone else want to jump in and add one yeah i think building on that one resilience as well is um is important because you're as a creative um p- trying to then commercialize what you're what you're doing as an art form um and people are going to feed back on it and they're going to be honest about what they think and it it's it's all trying to serve a purpose so it it can feel when you're starting out like the feedback is really personal um and to be honest it can still feel personal like 10 years on but um, but when you have a lens of okay, this isn't actually aimed at me. It's this is about um, everyone who's involved here is trying to um, to reach an end goal, um, and we're all doing it together. So regardless of how it comes across to me, because I've I've put this time into it, um, and put this effort into it. It's um, looking at the, the feedback as a as kind of a a gift in some ways of okay, this is this is information I can use to get to the next stage and take it further um and just to be really resilient with that and um have a thick skin oh for sure so for the creatives just step out of the way of the target because it's not aimed at you right yeah absolutely yeah yeah um will yeah i the the one thing that i would uh say is uh don't be afraid to ask for help and i think that works in two ways really one is um if you're not sure about something that's been asked of you from the client or a collaborator um just it's it's a lot easier to pick up the phone or send an email um and and ask for clarity on that rather than uh, getting yourself in a kind of hole of, of trying to decipher something that might even have been a spelling mistake in the original brief um and the other kind of side to that is and something that we found um as as Ben was saying earlier, is our USP, but also something that has massively helped uh, in the kind of context of this uh, pandemic that we're in the middle of, is that we we collaborate with um, creatives quite a lot in 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 the kind of bigger briefs in particular, where we, there's moving parts and there's people that we can bring in that are experts in their field, and it it just kind of sometimes it's helpful to have that kind of uh, other point of view of a brief and and have someone on your side kind of uh building you up towards that common goal and and um just again make sure that you're not kind of in this uh lone sometimes isolating world of being a sole composer or um like a sole creative on a job <laughs> and that's so prevalent right now isn't it being isolated <laughs> yeah I, yeah i've been seeing so many examples online of um of people coming together like uh e- even just on the music side of things creating you know orchestras online and brand new pieces of music through the internet it's it's really cool to see and pete your hands up. Oh, I feel like everyone had the really poignant things. Um, <laughs> so all the good ones. I think um, just a couple of things from me, really, if I'm allowed. Like one um, being, don't feel um, like you have to buy all the gear first before you start creating lots of music. I think people can feel really limited by what they have, but um, you know, there's. I think to start building those skills, like what makes a really good composition is music is music. Like you can write something amazing with some manuscript paper and a pencil. You don't need to have um, thousands, thousands of pounds worth of um, equipment and you don't have to have a recording studio either. Um, I think it's testament like the the pieces of music people are creating with very little is, is it's just amazing. And I think to start building in those, those skills and learning, um, you know, how to write to picture and what makes that tick and how to work around hit points and how to write good melodies and how to get out of the way of VO and stuff is, I think that's more important than, um, spending all your savings on like a fancy synthesizer. Um, and also uh, I think as well, in terms of building skills, I think building and learning the ability to work with others and like Kamal was saying, receiving criticism and critique and and being open as as Will was saying to others, um, input is far more 
important than um, having a CV that says you've got like a music degree from Cambridge and um, you've won and you know you're kind of you've got all the qualifications I think who you are as a person and if you're really reliable and great to work with and you're fun to be around I think are, are much more important qualities to have. So awesome gyms not all the best ones were taken Pete <laughs> and <laughs> I just heard a big collective scream around the world that musicians shouldn't buy new gear because you know how addictive we are. <laughs> As Olaf says in Frozen 2, advancing technologies will be both our savior and our doom. So there you go. Oh my gosh, that's so <laughs> deep. Um, <laughs> so, do you want to talk about anything that you're working on right now? Please laugh. Sorry, I'm still laughing at these. Oh. quoting Frozen 2 a lot at the moment. <laughs> it's because I saw it the other day, and Ben, you, Ben, you've been hyping about Frozen 2 so much, and I was like, oh, whatever. And then I watched it, and I was like, oh my gosh, this film is one of the most edifying things I've ever consumed for. <laughs> um, and it was a million times better than the first one as well, which I, I didn't know was possible for a sequel. Yeah. Oh, I loved it too. And I brought my teenage boys. They're going to kill me for saying this. So we were sitting in the cinema with all these little girls. <laughs> it was amazing. I think that's got to stay in this edit, Victoria. That has to. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. So um, just to end off with, do you want to talk about what you're working on right now? We're working on a whole range of, of different things and in some ways kind of sums up the, the breadth of what we end up end up doing so um we have just delivered today a um a road safety song for children aged three to four um that will be uh that will be teaching them to cross the road safely um and then we're working on um pitches for some international brands and um and tv themes and all sorts of all sorts of stuff so there's a real like range of things and I think when even when we we call up some of the freelancers we're working with um we're we're currently working with them on a kid's song and then you call them up about something else and it's something completely different um that's that's opera based um I think even then they're a bit shocked (laughs) well not to make light of it because it's very important work you're doing but you know kids right now they just have to learn how to cross the bedroom (laughs) safely right just the very last thing because if you guys are anything like what we are we are overeating like crazy so what is your food of choice right now oh man uh, my my wife makes these really amazing Easter nests. It's like shred, shredded wheat with like oh, chocolate no. and like little mini eggs on the top. It's just insane. Mm. Oh, okay. Anyone else? Oh wow. Um... Oh, this is the question that stumped WMP. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, let's let's just leave it Whatever on the Easter will. nest. <laughs> I've, I've just been eating so healthily that I can't really answer, to be honest. No, you can't. You can't leave me being the only one that's eating unhealthily. That's really unfair. <laughs> Amazing. Do you um? Do you guys have? Do you guys have serene malt loaf in LA? I don't think so, but it sounds very intriguing. It is like it's kind of like this stodgy, like bready, like kind of goodness it's like a you get it in this little loaf and it lasts forever um, and it tastes really good really good with butter i i, I think I'm, I'm doing a terrible job of describing it but it tastes phenomenal and i'm i'm very sad for you that you you can't get hold of it over there it makes me very glad i never moved <laughs> well if it lasts forever then you could probably mail one to me and i'll get it in a couple of weeks and it'll still be fine so. oh it would do you know what it would be and it would taste just as good i think <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, Well, on that very wonderful note, I'd like to thank all of you for joining me today. I know it's um, been a really tough situation, challenging time, but it sounds like you're all really staying positive, which I commend you for. And um, as always, continue the excellent work. And I'm sure we'll hear a lot more from WMP. So thank you so much, guys, for joining today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us. All right. We'll check you later. 